the said eighth we point game with our winter sweep. Because you said we weren't going to cover it. That's why. Well, yeah. And every time you say something, mm-hmm. say we're not going to beat the Eagles in the playoffs. Say it 10 times. Every time you say something, the opposite happens. Nah, man. I want y'all to go as far as y'all can. Same. Until y'all meet us. Oh, you're not going farther than the Bears. Everybody is. My high school team went further than the Bears. <laughs> you're not going farther than the Bears, bro. Let's go ahead and get that out your head. Because we out here. Kerry, when's the last time you watched the Bears game? <laughs> It's been a while. It's been a while. All right. Because I watch them uh, quite often and y'all suck. Oh, man. Like a Slander. High. All right. So I'm going to put this on. How did we do this last time? Remind me. How did I share it last time? Because we did some. The the oh, yeah. That's right. Okay. Boom. Boom. All right. Boom. Oh, hey. All right. Boom. All right. Boom. Yeah, we get to, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, you talking like oh, niggas. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, the Marcus, go ahead and share it the same way you did last time. Everybody can catch that, and then we will. Uh, we'll mad. go ahead and get this rocking and rolling. Let's go. You know I'm saying. So let's go ahead and share the screen real quick. I'm you know saying the mission statement. So boom. Um, uh. uh Oh, yeah, there we go. Oh, I can't minimize. Okay. Boom. So uh, this is the Be A Light podcast mission statement. We the number one mentorship for mindset, development, career ascension, education, and leadership cultivation. Uh, we are authentic, <clears throat> positive. We respect our sex, race, religion, political views, and preference because we for our people, and we like to have a great sense of humor. Um. And just to let y'all know, man, we are bringing this podcast to you guys because we are addressing some things that we really, really need to see more of. Um, This is a very important conversation. Uh, We are blessed to be able to have these conversations as the men that we are in the positions that we are in, and we're acknowledging that. And um, man, it's about to be dope. So let's go ahead and get it rocking and rolling. So welcome back to the Be Like Podcast. It's your boy, K. Sloan, here with the homies. Jay Jones. Got Jay Jones, we got the brain in the building. It's your boy, Nate G. Nate G, then we got the wise, the watch, the wisdom. Mr. Lift and Go never introduces himself, but we do it for him in the morning. We That's, me. Know. That's you, brother. That's you. That's you. And then we have a special guest in the building. Young brother that's, that's done some things and he has some things to say. And he's very impressive. You guys are going to be impressed with this young brother. He's going to introduce himself real quick. So go ahead whenever you're ready, brother. Dr. Xavier Rice. Yeah, I yes, heard that. Doctor. Put some respect on his name, doctor. <laughs> Y'all better. Y'all better. And um, man, you know, we ready to get this thing rocking and rolling. We got some things we wanted to get into. And I guess, uh, you know, Jarrell, would you like to kind of, you know, reframe the conversation in regards to where we took it last time and where we're going to take it this time? I do want to do that, but I first want Mr. Xavier to tell me, um, doctor, his his co- doctor, 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 to Come tell on. me his past, his college, past, like what happened from high school to college, the choices he had, oh, and yeah, yeah. what he did. I want him to tell. I want people to hear that first before I introduce some other stuff. So can you tell yes. me that, Mr. Doctor Xavier? For sure, man. So, um, a little bit about me. Um, born and raised in Fort Worth, funky town, Texas. Hey. Um, grew up in a family of four. I uh, got my two parents and my little sister. Um, I, I would say I grew up in meager beginnings. My dad was a truck driver for majority of my childhood, and then he fell ill, so kind of stumbled across uh, hard times when I was around 12, 13. So from there, um, I feel like, you know, I really uh, lived and breathed what it felt like to be poor or po- in poverty. Um, and then went to Crowley High School right here is a local high school. That's where I got my first exposure. This is, I lived in the city, but it's a suburban high school. It got it really gave me like insight into like, you know, what the other side looked like in terms of, you know, people with more money, more resources, more education. Um, did pretty well in high school. And then I had a 4.0 actually in high school. And so, uh, 
had a number of institutions, mostly state institutions. I, I only applied to state institutions because they were cheap enough for me to go to, right? right. Um, got a couple full rides. Um, one of them being Texas a and M, and I, I use them as honorable mention because that's where I was going. If you ask me when I was in, you know, the beginning of my 12th grade, I was going to Texas a and uh, partially because they had a medical program. You know, I wanted to become a doctor at this point. I had to determine that was my uh, plight in life, that I wanted to become a medical doctor. And the programs there seemed like they were the best. Uh, so then my dad, being the insightful man that he was at that moment, asked me had I ever considered Prairie View. I didn't know what Prairie View was. He educated me. He said, hey, you know, it's a historically black, black college and university. At that point in my life, I didn't know what a HBCU was, so I did my research and all. I and I asked a couple of friends, you know, asked a couple of teachers, and the only thing that people associated with Prairie View was party. I'm, you know, I mean, if I'm being honest, you know, that's all that. So there was party, party, party. So I went back to my dad. I'm like, ah, I'm, there's no way I'm going to this school, you know. Nobody really has anything positive to say about it other than that they have good parties. And he said something else insightful, and, and I'm giving his credit where credit due. He said, well, every school is a party school, and the only reason why people associate uh, Prairie View with parties is because they want to diminish the education that's there. So mm -hmm. well, I went on a, on a tour at Prairie View. It was hump day. You know, we'll get into that later, but if you know what hump day is at the HBCU, it's the liveest day of the week. And, and it was there where I really saw young men, young women in professional dress. Um, I saw Greeks walking around the yard. I got to meet with the director of the honors program. I got to meet with the director of the undergraduate medical academy, and they spoke life into me. They said that the education at Prairie View was superior to any education in the state of Texas, especially for a young black man. After that experience, it was a no brainer. I took my uh, talents to Prairie View and, you know, from there, you know, I can keep going, but Prairie View was the, was the place that propelled me forward to becoming a doc, the doctor I am today. Hmm. That's what I need y'all to hear. Yeah. Yeah. That's dope. It's funny that you said that too, uh, because when you said about the party thing, Demarcus had just said that yesterday. <laughs> he just said that. He's like, pretty much what he knew about it. And that's what I knew. I remember back in high school, like when guys said they were going to Prairie View PV parties. That's all I knew. But I didn't know nothing else about like the HBCU experience. And I wish like back then I would have knew more. But yeah, it's funny you said that. Funny you said that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be truthful, you know, I ain't gonna lie. The party's still alive. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's still gonna doing. have some fun, but it's our fun with uh, educated people. And and that's a different type of fun, especially when you with your people. Did you ever, did you pledge? Real quick, I don't mean that. Yeah, did you, did you pledge? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I'm a member of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Um, the term pledge, I we don't like to oh, use. don't use that. <laughs> all right, see, I don't, I don't be knowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you yes, are a yes. member. Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Yes, sir. I'm a member. See, that's that's what I missed out on, man. Man, me too. You remember yeah. Carrie and I? We talked about football. We not us not getting scholarship offers from HBCUs, and we didn't know why because. I wanted to play, you know, if they called, I probably would have ran to at least visit it, but I never even, I never received that call. So that hurt my heart to this day. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, now we can kind of talk about what we were talking about last time, just um, basically that pride in the black community. And I kind of brought up the De Dion situation because um, that's kind of how we started our conversation. Um, and I wanted you to kind of, let them know how you felt about it because I was trying to explain it, but I don't think I could do as good a job as you did. Um, so I think uh, you, you tell them how, what you feel about that situation. Sure, sure. So I'm gonna lead this you know, conversation by saying that I do appreciate Deion Sanders for what he did at Jackson State. I do not negate any of the work that he did during the three years of his tenure, but his the recent developments in his career here moving from JSU to Colorado was a great disappointment to me. I ain't gonna lie. Um, how I framed it to Jarrell is that I yearn for black leaders to emerge um, in the black community. And 
you know, back in the day, you know, civil rights era, um, the people who had clout were ministers, um, people of religious stature, uh, civil rights lawyers, really just thought leaders in general. But, you know, with the current climate, the platform is you know, the black men that we know to be influential or athletes and entertainers. So, you know, some of the first people that come to your mind when you think about superior black men or black leaders in the country, they tend to be, you know, entertainers or athletes. LeBron James, Jay-Z, you know, uh, Ice Cube or uh, Deion Sanders, right? Right, right. So I yearn for him to be that change I wanted to see in HBCU athletics, bringing back the value to HBCU athletics. And I think that um, he started the work, but he didn't finish it. And I don't think that he will have the lasting effect that he intended to have or what I thought he intended to do. And to be honest, to uh, like give it a blanket statement, I think he had ulterior motives the whole time. Mm. And I wasn't I wasn't uh, naive to that, but I also wish that he would have stuck it out a little longer so that he could we could see the fruits of his labor. Mm. Man, that's y'all do what y'all do. Because I was trying to help. <laughs> Let y'all do what y'all do. Hey, hey, that was ever so eloquently put, Doc. Um, and I would have to say that I think that you made some very valid points. And I think that I, I would say that, though you could say that the work is not done for sure, 100%. I, I just, I think the thing we were talking about when we were on here last time is I think that, you know, my whole mindset around it is the fact that he did that much in that time frame, it made that much of an impact, brought that much money to Jackson State. It almost showed that, like, man, it can be done, and a man can do it. Like, this this one man showed up and supercharged that whole school, that whole university, but it's like, maybe that's not the man for the job, though. Maybe he needs more of us. Maybe there's more. This It's a job that we all need to be uh, included within. I think that, like you said, the Altaria Motors thing, he showed up. You're probably right. Like 100 percent. I heard something the other day. They said that Dion, if any other school would have showed up, he would have took them over a Jackson State. It wasn't like he had an agenda to go to a HBCU. He just went there because it was the available job to get him started. He was a high school coach before then. But, you know, like you were talking about the past leaders, like sometimes I feel like some of our black leaders get into these leadership roles and it's not even like they expect it to be what they ended up becoming. And then they got there and then some of them decided to continue on that that journey. And some of them just said, you know, they stopped at that stop, got off. But at the end of the day, it's a collective thing. It's like we should be inspired by this. And I think we all have a role in that. And it it inspires me to see, you know, that something like that can happen. Because even now, you know, I'm just looking at the influence, bro. Like, I feel like there's so much of an influence when uh, a man of that or, or a man or woman of that type of stature goes and does something and people get behind it. That's magical, bro. It's like, like, wow, now the money starts coming. And that's what everybody's talking about is resources the whole time. So, I mean, I, I don't want to beat this dead horse because we kind of talked about it a little bit. But, I mean, <laughs> y'all want to add to maybe what he said. I thought that was, that was a good way to put that. I really do appreciate you adding that piece. Before DeMarcus starts disagreeing, <laughs> I'm going to say I don't. I don't totally agree or disagree because I, I do feel what you're saying. And I think a lot of it goes with what I was saying when we talked about this the first time. Yes, Dion might have started doing the work. You know, I, I feel that. I definitely feel when you say his work wasn't finished. It's just who go finish the work for me? It's do we really think he was going to be the one to finish it? We've had black college football around for a long time. We've had, and I, I'm only focusing this on on the football aspect of things, not even just HBCUs overall, because I think that's a whole another topic is how we treat HBCUs, right? Hearing your story about going to one, hearing Jarrell just say he didn't get no offers. I got one offer to TSU, was the only black school that offered me, and they didn't even have accreditation at the time. So I couldn't go. It was like, straight up, I'm just not going. But on the football side of stuff, I think about coaches like Eddie Robinson. It's not like he wasn't extremely successful, just one of the most successful coaches of all time. And it didn't really do anything to move the needle on college football at HBCUs. Dion did this because it's Dion, right? I don't think it's just because he went there and he had a little bit of success. And that's why I get both sides of it. 
use your platform, use your celebrity, you know, and do whatever you can. But the only reason that that needle was moving the way that we even paid attention to it was because it happens to be prime time. And so I don't know that it's really fair that we we put that kind of leadership on, on one person like that in particular. My thing, it got to be a, a community of desire to get that in a better situation, right? All of the, we have multiple black college conferences that play football. What are we doing as a black community to support those? Companies? That's just going to always be my kind of standpoint on it because it's not going to come from one person. It's other, it's an NFL coach coaching at the black school. Eddie George is an all-pro, no name in football, coaching at a black school. They don't get the same kind of attention that Dion does, all right? So it's just a, it's a weird thing to me. Demarcus is doing stuff now, man. Doing this. Get off your iPhone, Demarcus. Always. All right. But, you know, I think the, the real thing is how can we bridge that gap to make these things a finished product? How can we get to where we really want to be with it? And that's kind of what I wanted to pick your brain on today. Just hearing somebody talking about it from the other side on Dion. Do you think three more years, it would have made a, a real difference for HBCUs as a whole? Something like that. I'll leave it like that and ask you. So I, it's an analogy that I've been using as a recent that um, was going on. And uh, Mr. Lifting Go, I want to know um, um, <laughs> what you have to say about this, but you know, I, I use MLK, not no comparison between Deion Sanders and MLK, but just for the analogy's sake, just ride with me. It, you know, we Salem, we all, you know, it's a movie about it. We all understand that that was a pinnacle moment in the civil rights movement. Uh, the white people got to see the horrors of racism clear as day um, on TV, got to see people, you know, with hoses against peaceful marchers, right? And in that moment, MLK got the whole country's attention. Um, and for me, uh, in, on a very micro scale, not comparing it to MLK, that's what Deion Sanders did. But then he, after Salem, he just got off the train. He said, all right, I'm, I'm going to pass the mantle. And I put quotations around that because I don't know who he's passing it to, um, to the next person. And he didn't finish the work. And for me, MLK, after Salem, he went further and was a martyr for the cause. And the propaganda that Dion put out there sounded like that's what he was doing. He was being a martyr for the cause. And also asking Travis Hunter, who was the number one recruit at the time, to also be a martyr for the cause. And if you know when Travis Hunter got, um, he came to JSU, it was only a year ago. That man, Travis Hunter, no matter where he goes, is going to the NFL. We know that. So it is. It would have been a lot of. Uh, it would have just been very powerful to see Travis Hunter go to the NFL in the first round from JSU. That would have had a last change. That would have been a historical moment to see that in modern day, after years and years of you know the Bamas and the Georgias and the Clemson at SEC, right? You know, like seeing them dominate and seeing a, a player from a historically black college and university get drafted on that big stage on TV. Come on, man. That would have changed. That would have changed the perspective for years to come. And now every back boy that's a four star, five star, whatever recruit, they can say, man, Travis Hunter did it so I can do it, too. I totally agree with that. That is in the exact point that I've made before is that it really is on the athletes ultimately to me. Uh, me and Jarrell talked about that back when we was in college, how if we really want to see that change, these four and five star kids start going to different schools. That's what's going to make the change go because to me, regardless of who your coach is, if the athletes and the talent is there, the cameras follow, the money follow. So I also like what you said about the MLK thing. However, what that really makes me think about is it's a good comparison, but there were other people, other major figures in the civil rights movement. And maybe that comes along if Dion stays there and keeps that spotlight on, maybe that comes along. Because right now we've always had the conversation of not enough black coaches. Black coaches don't get opportunities. 
So what was it going to be that really moved the needle for the entire HBCU football conference landscape, not just Jackson State in the sweat, right? The MEAC, the SIAC, is other places out there that we're not hearing them get that same kind of love because Dion wasn't a part of that, that uh, conference. So that's why I don't really put too much of it on Prime more so as the overall thing we have to develop it as a community and make it something that's that important. And look, I'm guilty of it. I can't tell you my favorite black so It's probably TV because I'm down the street from it. <laughs> I'm wearing an Ohio State shirt right now, right? Because that's where my college entertainment comes from for football, right? So if we start doing that with black schools. I think it does change. I don't know when, but I think it has to be more than just, you know, one coach out there. And again, it's not the problem any good coach or he didn't have good things that he was doing. It's that it's Deion Sanders. And I don't think we care this much if it's not Deion Sanders. Look at Eddie George. He That's just, why I brought him up. Yeah. All right, DeMarcus. Not, uh, I <laughs> think we give too much credit Kind of what Nate is saying, but I think we give too much credit to the position that Dion has and like trying to make him this martyr or whatnot. Uh, the things he said that he was going to do it, uh, he did. He put he put HBCUs on the map. He put he got he brought game day there. He got an NFL coach there. He he got players that that come there. And this is a transfer portal. I mean, that was going to mess up anything, anyways. But got everybody there in the transfer portal. You know. Uh, won two championships, and he's moving up and bringing more jobs and bringing more eyes to to everything. I'm, I don't, I don't understand what what more that people want him to do. How long do you want him to stay? The same thing. Uh, y'all know coaches; they don't they don't have a long lifespan in, in most areas thinking. anyways. So if if the next season he flops, uh, you know, and and somebody else finds a way to beat his system, we're not even talking like this. I I just think that. So much has been levied on Deion Sanders, and he actually did what he said he was going to do, and now he's going through a high, a high platform. He's going to Colorado. They were one and eleven year last year, and if he could change that program around, being a black coach, he's he's making more money than any other uh, coach uh, in his his little platform outside of the the big shooters. I mean, the big hitters. Like, I just think we we putting too much on. Dion and want Dion do, to do the work that we should all be doing. Yeah. Dr. Rice, how you feel? I mean, y'all put, both posed the same question. How long should he have stayed? I think he should have stayed till his recruits got to the NFL. That's how long. If he would have did that, he made this decision, um, I would have been okay with it. The things that I'm, I'm – as just as a man in general, right, you know, he has a son playing quarterback. There's no chance that he's winning the Heisman at JSU. We all know that, you know, he he talked about it. He he pushed the uh, agenda, but it's never going to happen. So also, it was a pivot in my eyes for his family. He's giving his son a better shot at that title, a better shot to be on a big stage so that he can transition to the NFL. And so for me, that's also why he did it. His son is not Travis Hunter. You know what I mean? He's competing against, you know, the best quarterbacks in the country at the best schools in the country uh, in terms of football. So, yeah, I mean, I I do, in a sense, understand that we put to I put particularly, I can't say we, but I put too much responsibility on him. But, I mean, it's that, it's that yearn that I mentioned earlier that, like, I just want somebody to just take up the mantle. It don't even have to be football, man. It's the black agenda, the black community. And we just need a leader. And don't get me wrong. There's, there's leaders in the community. That's on a micro level and a macro level. That's when we really cultivated change within America is when we had that leader. And he said, this is the agenda. We want racial equality, which we still don't have, but that's a whole nother story. We got some progress in that, in that area. Right. And so what is the black agenda now? We can't define it because we don't have the leaders to tell us, you know, and that we can agree on. The thought leaders that sit there on stage, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and have this discussion, right? 
You know what I'm saying? Oh, well, I want to do it this way. You want to do it this way. At least they were talking about it at the highest level. Dr. Rice, if you don't mind if I interject, I think that what you're saying, it sounds like exactly what a lot of us, when we see those strong black men that come up in different areas and we get excited and we like, man, this the, is this the one. But, you know, because we've, our culture is so focused on sports and entertainment, the sports figures and entertainers end up being the people that we look at to, to, to take us there. And these aren't the people that's necessarily qualified to do so. You got people that's doing work. Like there's people out here doing work, but they're not on ESPN and running on the ticker. And we don't see them on CNN all the time. I mean, we got, you know what I'm saying? I, no no talk down to the man. Uh, what, the, the uh, what's that? Is it Herschel? Herschel Walker. Oh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> No, 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 no. You know what I'm saying? Don't talk down or nothing like that. But y'all see what we got going on, too. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's, Dion's like the man right now for us. We're looking at Dion like, yo, you the pinnacle of, so, and when he not ready to do that, we can't, I mean, it's like, it's that Superman complex that we have mostly as black men walking around here. That's what I was doing. Put us all on your back, man. Take off with us. Like, everybody not really ready for that. It's like, we got to kind of, it's like you said, Everybody has to shift the focus and we do have to get kind of on even even ground in regards to like what do we what do we want us to look like? What do we want where he wants to go? Like that's something that I think is so powerful. And I think it starts with like the exposure of you know what a leader is, who are we looking up to? The youth. The youth is really the ones that have the, the power to change things. Like there's a young Dion coming up again, there's a young Xavier Rice, a young Jarrell Jones, a young uh, Nate G, there's, there's young all of us, you too, Mr. Lippingo, there's a young all of us that's looking to become us, you know what I'm saying? How are we carrying that torch? What are we doing? Are they seeing us, you know what I'm saying? When we got something, <clears throat> excuse me, that's bothering us, you know, on a job or whatever, and we just switch jobs and we don't stay in spots where it's supposed to be, you know, us changing what's going on there and stuff like that. Like, we have to do the same things we expect Dion to do because he's only showing us on a major level what we are pretty much doing is chasing the bag. Like we we all end up, I mean, for the most part, we chase the back coaching as a coach of Jarrell. You know, that's why that will let me out of it. Bro, yeah. I, I, I wasn't getting the bag I needed. I had to go. I got kids. Got a jet. I don't care if OPSU was, you know what I'm saying, the most prestigious HBCU in the nation. If they wasn't giving me the money I needed, I ain't gonna lie. I probably left too just because, you know, resources wise, we not like just winning like that out here. Like if you look at the stats, we behind, bro. And, and it's like, there is a, you got to find a balance. You got to find a balance and you need the right type of leadership. I, and I'm glad that we're talking about leadership because leadership is what's going to change things. It's like the ship, we all in it together. We all in it together. But, you know, who's steering that bad boy? And, and, and how, do, how are we going about, you know, dealing with what's going to come? And how are we going about having conversations? And what are we focusing our attention on? All this stuff's important. So, Man, I, I like I like the way this conversation is going. This is this is this is getting good. I like this. I like this. It's it's, it's hurtful because you're asking for an agenda and a purpose, but I still have to take care of responsibilities. Mm-hmm. And the responsibilities that, of course, come from funds seem to supersede the agenda and the purpose. Mm-hmm. When you talk about the ones that came before the Black Panthers, the Whoever they had they 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 agenda and they purpose and they stuck to their purpose because as a collective they stayed together for the for the monetary value. If you didn't have a place to stay, well, I got I got you till you can get on your feet or whatever. But everybody, you said we all on the same ship. Everybody kind of jumped on their own little ships because it's like, well, my ship is gonna take me here. My ship is gonna take me here. I go find this little island and stay over here. It's not as as strong as a collective anymore. And that's what that's what we're blaming Dion for. Oh well, he went for the money. Yeah, I ask the question. What you say? I question. I, in no way do I want to compare us to white culture, but I just want you to like think a little bit. Like, who are our white leaders out who who lead in the country? Um, and the first people that come to mind is people like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. Donald Trump. Donald Trump, unfortunately. (laughs) Um, And I'm just stop right there. All of them have something in common. And what is it? Money. Money, right? So 
you said <laughs> something that I thought was very profound. You said it was agenda, purpose, and responsibility, right? So the no. thing that's preventing people from sticking to the the formers is the responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. But a lot of those leaders have that figured out. They not they don't. That's not a thought. Like how they gonna feed their kids is is not even a worry. So when you look at the black billionaires, I I, I kind of have the same understanding. Like hey man, Jay Z, you really? I mean, you have a beautiful family. And I know you want to tend to them, but they also, they're taken care of monetarily, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so what, what, what agenda and purpose are you committed to for us, right? <laughs> and so when I compare apples to oranges, you know, black billionaires and white billionaires, they're being the thought leaders of whatever community they want to claim. And what are our black billionaires and millionaires doing? Okay. I and I looked this up. But our black billionaires and millionaires are mostly <laughs> comprised of athletes and entertainers. Mm-hmm. So we are going to discredit athletes and entertainers when it comes to trying to provide a purpose or an agenda because nobody wants to say it, but they're an athlete, they're an entertainer. Not a they're not politician, they're not. They're not and what was that? I interrupted because they're not anymore. LeBron James is worth a billion dollars. He didn't get there by just being an athlete, right? Oh, no. I'm just saying that the majority of the people that's, that's at the top are comprised because of entertainment and, and athleticism. And I mean, LeBron got there because of his athleticism and, and how he entertains. He made great business decisions to get to the level he's at. But he started because of his athletic ability, his athletic ability, and then it brought so many eyes, and that's that's a part of entertainment. And even and even when LeBron tries to push a purpose, I mean, he had that that little stint where he had his peers to tell him shut up and dribble. Like I was just about to say that. It's a. Uh, I also found that <laughs> I don't, I don't think a lot of people know this, but outside of athletes and entertainers, HBCUs. Produced the most millionaires in America. I did mm. not know that until that. I didn't know that either. That's big. And that's formers, doctors, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, engineers. They they produce a lot of the. I looked at the top ten uh, black owned businesses. Maybe like six of them started with a, 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 a African American that's, that's literally an engineer. They just they they created something or a product. Like Coke, there's a, a a black owned business that is uh, partnered with Coke, and those those Coke bottles that are they look like the glass bottle, but they're plastic and they have like the little silver top on them. He developed that bottle for Coke and exclusively exclusively for Coke, which of course brought his his net worth to where it is. But we don't, we don't even know those type of things. But we don't we don't give a lot of credit to the HBCUs because that, that's not that's not really marketed out there for us. We're we're more marketed towards inter, being entertained, which is unfortunate. But it's uh, hey, it's the truth. Yeah, and society tells us what it wants us to know. Like we don't research that. Like you just said, what you did, you looked that up. So like, if you didn't look that up, it, all we doing, like you just said, we we being entertained, we watching football, we on our phones. We don't research stuff like that. Because if I told a young man like a young man that stat you just said that HBCUs create the most millionaires, they might actually think about going. Not even the athletes. So that's something they need to hear. But yeah. Really what it all come down to, man, is changing the perception and then following up with the action to keep the perception changed. Like that's why my thing is ultimately what are we as a community gonna do? It's cool to say athletes because yeah, they got the paper for athletes and entertainers. And it it's that simple. If the athletes and entertainers really sat down with whatever black leader we have, right? And say, Y'all come together and let's do something for the community. The paper is there. Is it gonna be sustainable? Who knows? Because we can't predict, but we have at least the opportunity to try to do that. It's just what's really important, right? 
And until we shift that, until we actually, like, I like the, the saying having a black agenda, until we actually have a clear black agenda, we ain't getting nowhere, bro. Because it's people, this is where we can we can have this conversation. It's been so entertaining to me because I've been sitting on Twitter all day looking at people go back and forth about this very conversation, all right? And nobody's coming up with a real solution. Ain't nobody saying this is what you do. It's just, well, he should have stayed there because, like the market said, he should have been Superman. He should have been the martyr for us. And I understand that. But what really come out of it? If Deion stayed there for 10 years and win 10 SWAC championships, you can't really tell me that the whole HBCU landscape is going to get better because of that. Because at the end of the day, how many other schools are going to recruit top kids? I'm going to play for Dion because of Dion. Right? I'm not going to play for black coach at black school just because it's a black school. Right? So I think it's just a, it's always about change the perspective on everything. So once we come together and we say we want to see true black, that's why I put that in the, in the group message earlier. Let's talk about how do we actually support black excellence, right? Because a lot of times we're talking about, when we're talking about all this other money, we're talking about white mediocrity and family wealth is really what a lot of that stuff comes from. So we want to see black excellence either match or surpass that. How do we actually support that and see it grow? I, I, I think to add to that conversation, you saying how do we support? I think number one, you gotta suffocate black ignorance. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think that's that's number one. Um, we all talked about where we come from in the past on podcasts. Uh, you talked a little bit, Xavier, about where you from, and we know that there's certain things that you know. You talk about black people, there's certain things we reward and we honor and we put up on a high esteem. That you know what I'm saying? You you kind of scratch your head. You be like, man, this is where we putting all our energy towards. Like this is. This is it. Like, it's almost like you feel like you're living in like an alternate reality sometimes if you really like worried about your, you know, well-being, your family, your finances. That's not necessarily normal for everybody that's, you know what I'm saying, like in our families and our friends. Like, that's just being real. Like, and I think there's a lot of different initiatives that's going in place, a lot of education going on, but it has to kind of consistently be a thing. Like, we got to consistently want to stomp out that ignorance, bro. Like, not knowing... It's only an excuse until you know. Once you know, your mind is expanded. It's not going back to where it once was, bro. Like once, once you know that most of our millionaires is coming from HBCUs, you can't just act like you didn't know it now. Like you know, let's act on it. Let's figure out what we need to do to get more of us out. I mean, like, yeah, we're going to PWIs as well. Like, I'm not knocking where nobody goes to school, but these are just facts. I mean, community is everything, community is everything. Once you get a community behind some man, people, when they come together, the collection of energy is powerful. So I think, you know, it's it's something that we really kind of need to focus on. But uh, yeah, man. I, and I also want to say this one little tidbit about college, because we are talking about college. You know, if if you go to any college, man, please, please, please don't take out money you ain't got. You know what I'm saying? Or you don't think you'll ever, you know, you don't have a plan on paying that money back because that's kind of creating what we're talking about as well. I saw a stat that said, and in, uh, in 2017, uh, HBCU students took out 32 percent more federal debt per student than non HBU students. And I was like, I was like, is that a thing? Like, that's like a I was, I was looking at that. I was like, but I, but I mean, we take out debt, man. We take out money a lot. Like you got to be aware. You got to be smart about what your plans are. You got to sit down with your parents. Like if you're a kid on this call, sit down with your parents, come up with a legitimate plan on how you get this money back. Because, hey, bro, I'm sitting in it myself. I, I'm speaking from experience, my brother. Like it's, it will cripple you, and it will literally guide your decisions um, later in life. So that's one of those things that kind of perpetuates issues as well. But it, we got to be versed. We got to expand our minds. We got to share information as we get it. So, man, you know, I think that's something I wanted to add to the conversation as well. But we can take it where we want to take it. Yeah, I was gonna say, Demarcus, I appreciate you um, citing that statistic because that's totally true. I mean. If we go to every professional community, like the most black lawyers come from HBCUs, most black doctors come from HBCUs, most black engineers, most black engineers, most black engineers. I can say that a thousand times <laughs> because it's, it's, it's an astronomical now. It's like, you know, of engineers come from HBCUs. So if I'm talking to a little black boy and he has no aspirations to become an athlete or entertainer, um, then I'm going to tell him to go to HBCU because that's where he's going to succeed the most. But the question is, you know, 
um, it, it, I, I call it the little black boy complex. Is all of us grew up in, in one instance of our life. We either wanted to be an entertainer, we wanted to be an athlete, uh, we wanted to maybe do something else, but I'm gonna leave that off the call, right? Because every little black boy has that option, right? That's what we grow up seeing. That's what we grow up valuing. And I, I really think that was purposeful, right? Like that's that's what we grow up wanting to be. A little bit about me, like, I mean, I want y'all to look up my stats after this just because I got to relive my glory days. My senior season, I had over 100 tackles. I had, you know, many forced fumbles, interceptions. I, I had an offer from a D1 school, right? Like, I grew up wanting to go to the NFL until I changed my mind and realized I'm 5'8 and I'm not going. You know what I mean? That's just that's just what I told myself, right? But I still had the same little black boy complex. If I could be in the NFL versus being a doctor right now, which one you think I'm going to choose? <laughs> and I'm 26. I'm I'm already a, a, in do- residency as a doctor established, right? So how do we read? And it's, you said suffocate the ignorance. How do we read? that little black boy complex of wanting to be those things over wanting to be a doctor, over wanting to be a, a mayor, over wanting to be, you know, a, a chef owning their own restaurant, entrepreneur. I don't know. I really don't have the answer to that question because. Exposure, you know, <laughs> exposure, 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 exposure. The thing that. Raising <laughs> your kids. <laughs> That's Teaching those children. Yeah, you about you about to learn. You about to hey, you about to get first hand on that one, Nate. You the video. You about to get you about to get that too. But no, I think I think like going to museums, traveling. I'm telling you, traveling taught me just learning different cultures. Taught me everything I need. Like most of the things I need to know in life. Um, just like every time I travel, every time I saw something, it made me want to learn more about it. Because it's almost like I mean, I, I wanted to go to the NFL. Uh, my whole life even I played college football like you said once I realized I wasn't I wanted to coach I just wanted to be a football football period but like when I traveled and I saw other people doing other things and I, I it made me research that and I was like that sounds cool I never wanted to be a counselor but coaching is counseling like I had a degree in counseling coaching is counseling basically you you coaching you, you making sure the, the young man mental health is good they physical, everything. You want them to be overall just well, everything. Mental, physically, everything. So once I started counseling, I did some research before I started counseling. But once I started counseling, it was like, man, I'm still changing the world. I thought the only way I could change the world is by coaching and playing football. Because that's all I was taught. But once I, you know, it's other ways, teaching, uh, you know, professors, anything. You can, you can, I thought the only way to change the world was football. But you can change the world doing anything, man. But people need to know that. They need to hear that. They need to hear this podcast, you know? So. That's why I'm so adamant about raising your kids, man, because they really do start at home. That when you say exposure, when you say what are you seeing as cool? What are you seeing as possibilities and realities in your life? That started at the house, man. That started when you were a kid. So we really do a better job as a culture teaching our kids there's so many more options. If you great, cool. But chances are, you ain't going to really be that good at sports. It's not that many of them. So it's a lot of other jobs that you can go and do. And you can, you ain't even got to be the best. You can be pretty high at it and make enough money to take care of yourself. All right. So it's really just, it start with the youth. It's changing their mindset. Yeah. And, and I think statistically, we talk about like the sports box or the entertainment box, the, the percentage is lower for you to go make your money now. Because if you banking on that, it's you and millions and millions of other people that's running in that same direction. So if we start celebrating those little talents that we see within the youth that, you know, maybe this kid does have an interest in coding. Maybe this kid does have an interest in, you know, marine biology. And we start to, you know, put those ornaments on those type of, you know, what I'm saying uh, boxes and show them like, hey, this is dope. Like we want to encourage that. Like, well, Cause we, I'm telling you, bro. Like I see these dads with these youth football teams that be acting like their son is Cam Newton. You know what I'm saying? Like Odell Beckham. It's like, look, man. Like I get it. Like this is something that you take pride in because it's the time you get to share with your son. But at the same time, are you celebrating with him the same way when he go up there and he get you RAs on his report card? 
You know what I'm saying? Is that the same type of celebrations? Right. You putting the same type of fit on him, you getting them J's and whatnot. You know, make him feel good about himself because you're encouraging that that stuff. You know what I'm saying? You got you got a like Xavier Rice who, like I'm sure, and I don't know how you was raised, brother, but it sounded like you was raised well to be as young as you are. And I'm sure you had an influence that was encouraging what you ended up becoming. And we gotta continue to do that. Like when we catch young brothers that's lost, because we see them every day. That's lost. Like you can't be afraid to be able to reach out their hand and be like, "Hey, man, like I appreciate what you're doing. That may not be something everybody else is supplying, but I know that's gonna change what, what I see out here. Like I'm gonna go ahead and lend you maybe even a couple of dollars if I if I believe in what you're doing and I know you're gonna you know return my investment. Let's do business. You know what I'm saying? Let, let, let's do stuff like that. Like so, man. I, I I think that's that's powerful in itself. Mark. Straight up. I see. I, we went over the ones. That, some of the things I was talking about, but I learned this from a guy, I read it somewhere where, kind of like what Carrie was just saying, we give our kids this boss life and the shoes, the clothes, all this rah-rah for sports. But then when it comes to real life and you know the success after high school, we don't really get them the tools to succeed in that sense. And some of us don't have those tools, yeah. but we we can't be, we can't be, that's a statement that I, I really hate, that ignorance is bliss. We can't be so ignorant that we just lie in bliss because we get, we need to either help our youth, help our children, or go find the person or people or the information to help them. That's why I put, don't be hoarders of information for opportunities. You know, sometimes we get the opportunity and we're like, uh, I ain't telling nobody about this opportunity because this is just for me. Kind of like, yeah, kind of like with Dion, like you go to a, a higher level and then you bring people up, you spread your wings so that more people can enjoy the opportunity, man. There's opportunity, me, Gerald, the charities, all this stuff. There's so much opportunity. Even even uh, Dr. Rice, there's so, so many opportunities for everybody to succeed. We can't be so damnified on wanting to hoard our own opportunity. And I can't tell you this. I'm not helping you. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that because it's not helping us all as a collective. It's like mm -hmm. what you were talking about with the boat situation. It's not helping everybody as a collective. If you're just helping yourself, then you're just helping yourself. That's that's a one off. But our race seems like the only ones that's like that. You know, we 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 get it and we hold it because we don't want to give it to somebody else because they might take my job or we get it and people start hating on us. It's like one of the two. In our in our culture, but uh, that's just sad. I wish we could, like y'all was saying, come together and, and build something great. But we can. I, I ain't gonna say I, we can do that. We just have to do it. <laughs> we really just have to do it. You, you know, like I, I'm happy that like I I can believe that the brothers on this call will be leaders in the community, right? And I think you know. Right now, as I see it, you know, I think that those people are emerging in our micro communities, especially um, this uh, new generation of uh, black men. I, I think it's millennial black men and uh, specifically are stepping up to the plate and and really becoming the change that we want to see. Um, not all, but definitely a bigger amount than what the people before us, the generations before us, um, they were broken down by the systems and now we're rebuilding the systems and I'm proud of that. But what can happen on a macro scale? Who leads us on a macro scale? Because the change, the changes, change is slow. Don't get me wrong. It's always going to be slow. Um, but when you do it in these micro communities, it's going to be even slower. Right. And we may not even live to see um, some of the changes we want to see. And to be honest, I'm a little ambitious. I want, to see it in my lifetime. I want to see um, the progression of our race, specifically descendants of slaves. I can get that nitty gritty about it, like to, to progress. And how can we change the values within our culture um, to stop valuing, you know, the little babies <laughs> and start valuing, you know, the Don Peoples. I think I got his name right, hopefully. Um, he, he's a millionaire, black millionaire, um, uh, multi, 
a millionaire. I, he actually may be a billionaire. I might be mistaken. I ain't checked his bag in a while. But yeah, like, but nobody don't even know that name, you know? But we do know little Baby. So I just, you know, yeah, we're we, we going we gonna to raise our kids right. That's a requirement, right? We, we're holding each other accountable you know, to, to that. You know, we're, we're going to go back and reach in our communities and, and pick up the, you're going to be a counselor. You're going to be a coach. You're going to be all these positive images that black young men need to see, but how can we do it on a macro scale? And that's kind of what I was referring to from Dion. He finally put it, the propaganda on the big screen. You know what I mean? He finally saying it. And and, the, and it's not going on deaf ears. People are listening. And then because he has to preserve himself, you know what I mean? He Thanks. made a different decision. And that's why, you know, I was enraged. I mean, he, he, saw, my, he, <laughs> he saw it. I was, I was angry on yeah, Saturday. Was I was angry because I am a product of an HBCU. I know what it means to our culture. I wish that I could get every little girl, little black girl and little black boy to go to an HBCU. You know what I mean? If if I can get 100% enrollment of all our black boys and little girls, that'll be something that I'll be proud of. But, you know, um, it's not going to start until we start preaching that on a macro scale. I'm happy, you know, it's, it, you know, we got somebody in office. Let's not, let's give Kamala her, her, her uh, flowers. She graduated from Howard and she in the second biggest seat in the world. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, man. Um, that, that's just my two cents. I, I would like to add too. Like, I think that's powerful what you're saying. And that, that, now you got that versus the resource conversation. You know what I'm saying? And then they're going to say, well, you know what I'm saying? Like you said, those, those young black boys and young black girls that decide to go elsewhere, it, it more than likely is going to be because of resources. Mm -hmm. It more than likely going to be because if you look at Harvard and their funding, they are they getting a bigger endowment than all the HBCUs combined. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's where it's like, OK, like we get it. Now, the little babies who are going to bring crowds and, uh, you know, what I'm saying all these people, they, they selling out these arenas. All right. When they start saying, hey, this is what's important to us. We're going to listen. We're going to because we're listening already. You say you got to go where the eyes and the ears are already at. And I think that those types of things are slowly, like you said, on the micro level, you're seeing more of it. But on the macro level, it's like you wonder what's going to, you know, penetrate that. And then when I look at like Ice Cube, well, what he's doing with like Big Three and like, you know what I'm saying, like the type of uh, impact he make in creating his own league. And I'm just looking at, you know, just different uh, people that have gone from like their entertainment roles or their athletic roles to kind of transcend. Even LeBron, he got his school. Um you know, the impact they're trying to make, it's it's slowly but surely happening, but everybody got to play their part. You know what I'm saying? I, I, that's, that's my take on it. Everybody's not, you know what I'm saying, Martin Luther King, man, you know, everybody's not Malcolm X. Some people are going to be, you know, little people on, on the totem pole, but you got to do your work. You know what I'm saying? Where we are is where we are, and you got to do with what you, you got to do what you have to do with what you have. You know what I'm saying? Right now, I think we're doing that. You know, media is a very powerful platform, um, very, very powerful tool. I think putting stuff out there for people to be able to watch, people to be able to read, people to be able to listen to is, is going to be able to resonate and they can run it back over and over and be able to get some seeds from. So this has been a powerful conversation overall. Um, but, you know, in closing, we always like to talk about, you know, ways that we can unlock that light, man. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start with uh, Mr. Lift and Go, you know, say how, how do you feel like we can unlock that light right now? You know, say after the conversation we had. How, how are we unlocking that light within ourselves and in our, in our listeners? I think we have to learn and understand. We're getting there. I think we have to learn and understand that we are more than just entertainers. And I, we've, we've said this before, but we are more than just entertainment. Sports is a form of entertainment. We are more than just entertainment. And, and we have to we have to get smarter about money, you know, being financially literate, but we are more than just, if we can get that we are more than just entertainers across, I used to tell the boys and stuff all the time, like there's, there are other ways to make money than entertain. 
sing and dance and sports there are other ways to make money. And, and that and that will last longer. I mean, we we got an example right here on the podcast. I want to ask him, can I borrow five dollars? But he like dirty right. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. Um I, I I take it next though. You know what I'm saying? I, I just kind of piggybacking, man. I think I think unlocking that light really, you know, this is for everybody. I want you to understand that listening to people and understanding their perspective is how you unlock your light. You know what I'm saying? Put yourself in the shoes of somebody else. Um, somebody that's listening to this and you feel like maybe you didn't know some of the things you heard tonight or in the morning whenever you listen to this, really put yourself in the shoes of the people on this call and the people out here in America that's dealing with these things and be able to unlock that light inside of you by empathy. Because the power of empathy is the, is the ability to be able to change things for real, for real. Because once we can all empathize and a lot of things going to change real quick, real quick. But I think a lot of times we we put ourselves and isolate ourselves. And you got to really be able to understand the human, understand there's a human that you come into contact with every single day. And you need to really be able to know, know what they're dealing with. You don't have to address it all the time, but you should at least know because it'll help you, you know what I'm saying, how you make your move. So I wanted to add that to it. I say be about it. When we talk about it, be about it, man. It's really that simple. Action get results. Yes, sir. And I say, uh, just do your research. Like Demarcus, that uh, what he said today. I mean, I learned that I didn't know HBCUs had you know that many millionaires and everything. So do your research. But when you want to go to Texas a and when you want to go to Texas, when you want to go to Princeton, at least do your research. Uh, see if HBCU might benefit you in some way, and at least try it out. You know, maybe take a tour. Maybe you'll like what you see. So, are you gonna like what you see? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The school too. Yeah, yeah. Like you see. <laughs> hey, hey, oh, my, man. my fiance is a proud graduate of PBAMU, so you there know, you go. <laughs> I, I liked what I saw. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, nah, but uh, I would be remiss if I, I I didn't say how to unlock your light, man. Put God first; you'll never come in second, man. Ooh, that's. I'm gonna tell you that you know that that's at the core of my values. Um, I give God glory for all of my accomplishments and my future accomplishments. And I pray, you know, blessings over everybody listening that that you put you unlock the courage to put God first and really everything else will follow. He will add unto you abundance. So really, you know, that's that's my piece on the individual level for our culture. I'll, I think I always say three things. I think it's educational attainment. Right. Get your education, informal or formal. Read books. Open up textbooks. Open up. And if you don't want to read a book, get on YouTube. Watch some educational videos that you can also be entertained by. Um, second is economic cooperation. You know, I mean, it's we're the number one consumer in America. I don't know how, because it seemed like we all broke, but we're the number one consumer in America. How can we work together as a culture to put that money together to really cultivate change? And last but not least is, uh, is Black people's least favorite is civic engagement. Engage uh, at, in the government. You know, vote. Understand who you're voting for. You know what I mean? Or if you don't like the people you're voting for, be the person to vote for. You know, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, you know, in the country we live in, to see lasting change, it has to be through government. It has to be through, you know, senators and, and U.S. representatives and mayors and city councilmen and school boards and judges. And, and you know, I, I have a quarrel with the justice system, but through there, too. Yeah, um, we could have another conversation for that one, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, man. So... I, I hope that everybody can unlock their light and our culture can too. Absolutely, brother, man. We appreciate you coming to the platform, man. You brought some heat. Uh, you I brought some good, some good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> you told absolutely. me, don't tell me to remind you about that for y'all. Need you about the injury. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Fearless Foundation, December 17th. We, we, you know, we talked about it last time, but we still collecting toys to give out to the kids in the community, making sure. These kids have a great Christmas. Um, so Fearless Foundation is December 17th at 10 a.m. We will be giving away toys 
drive up, get into it. We'll be raffling our bikes and uh, scooters. Um, so come by and see us if you want to help out. Like DeMarcus said, if you feel it, if you really feel like you want to come out and help out, we can use you because it's a lot of cars that come out uh, and see us. So, uh, and then Nate, tell them about yours. You go. Yeah, same thing, man. Prosperous people. The weekend after December 24th, uh, time will be announced sometime this week. We're working on that right now. This boy came back with a whole bike. That's what we're raffling. We raffling that that's, one off. Bikes on what deck. What you mean? Let's go. That's Let's what go. And y'all saw my video with all the toys that they put up now. But y'all, you know, we have a lot of toys. So. Let's see, man. Do it for the children. Everything we do is for the kids. That's how you have a better tomorrow. Mm. Facts. Facts. So uh, make sure y'all like and subscribe as always. Tap in with us every single week, man. We're giving y'all that light energy, man. That light. That, that light needs to be a lot. Tap the link in the bio, you know what I'm saying? Get to know the get to know the people, man. Support us too, man. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna have a be like cash app up. So I ain't David <laughs> Ruffin and everybody. So man, y'all, y'all, y'all make sure y'all tap in and hey, it's been a blessing. Dr. Rice, we appreciate you coming to the platform again, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks yeah. for having me.